Welcome to AHA, which stands for a human among humans. Oh, that's really cool. Yes. I didn't know that's why you call it that. Yeah, we have a, an amazing human being you'll see tonight who's written a book. He might show us what the book is. Okay, I can do that right here. Yeah. Um, can get that, yeah. His uh, name is I, Michael Coran, as you know. This is Glenn Koenig. And tell us the name of your book. And My book is called A Man Wearing a Dress. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, it's kind of a large format book. And it's now out. It was published in uh, September. Mm -hmm. And you can get it at any bookstore. But we can go into more of the details about that yes. uh, later on. Um, and I took about three years to write it. it started we, in we can't officially sell things, but we can. If people want information and how to just get a look at this book, they can see it in many bookstores. Well, yeah, essentially, yeah. It, yeah. it's available online. There's a e ebook it. version, oh, and you can, you can avail it. yourself of it any way you like. Yes, I wanted to bring up some of the content of the book so you could see it with me. And you might want to know why this. Man, this handsome man, <laughs> wrote a book called A Man Wearing a Dress, and why, you might not be able to see now, he is wearing a dress especially for our show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's probably diff way different than you think, which will be one of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries of this show. Well, I don't know about that, but we'll, we'll yes. get into it. Um, I mean, the... Essentially what the book is, um, is uh, a story about my life, it's a memoir, uh, but I wrote it in a series of essays rather than uh, full-length chapters, so anybody who wants to read it, and it's available at libraries too, and if the library doesn't have it, they can get it quite easily. Uh, I know the Arlington Library has it where I live, and um, I haven't um, talked to people in the Cambridge libraries yet, but uh, they could obtain a copy probably quite easily because it's available from a common book distributor. Um, and I wrote it um, to tell the story of my life, starting the day I was born, actually, is when the first essay begins. And where and when were you born? I was born uh, down in Connecticut in 1950, so I'm 67 right now. Um, and I'm very lucky. My mother is uh, still alive. She's 97. She, wow. lives in, she lives in New Jersey and she lives in her own house. Oh, so my. I'm very happy about that. Mm. Um, so it's what I, I kind of made um, a marketing error when I wrote the book because people who know about the world of book sales and so on said uh, when I was writing it, at least one person said, you yeah, know, this is really two books. Uh, and I was a little too kind of sold on my own mission to write it as a single book. So I wrote it as one book, but it really has, it's almost in a way about my life, and it's also about gender identity as a, as a, as a topic. And it's not a, it's not a scholarly work or whatever. It doesn't have extensive footnotes to, uh, you know, other research and all that sort of thing. It's mostly my story and my observations and my life about not only my own search for my gender identity, and the things I went through on the way to that, but it also, from what I've observed around me, from what's going on with Maybe we'll begin in the middle, if you can okay. ignore this question, if you want. Why did you, when, first, when did you start wearing a dress? And how often do you, or when did you start wearing um, a dress? It's a, it was a slow process, but the process actually began for me when I began asking certain questions about my sexuality and my gender identity um, back around the year 2000, around the time I turned age 50. And I had sort of had hints, and the reason I wrote the story from day one in my life until now is that when I look back, I can say, oh, there are certain clues about what was going to happen for me that I want the reader to be familiar with. So to put some context for what I began to do when I got around age 50, I had just gotten married, I had never been married before, and for some reason, around that time, around 2001, actually, I began to do some searching on the internet for topics that I was afraid to search prior to that. And I was afraid to go to the library and ask for anything. And I even kind of surmised that my local library probably didn't have books about some of the things I wanted to ask questions about. And I've now learned that they have a lot more books than I thought, but nonetheless, 
Um, and I began a slow process. It wasn't just like one day I said, okay, I'm going to start wearing a dress. I began to look at how I felt about different things. And I looked and read, looked at and read many, many, many websites uh, with personal stories from people who had been through things, who had discovered um, certain sexual fetishes in their lives or practices or whatever, who went through the process of discovering they're bisexual, went through the process of a gender identity search within themselves, all that, and I just read a lot of stories about it. And then also I read stuff from, you know, people like psychologists who were trying to explain all this. Um, but mostly I just concentrate on so was personal it, experience. Was it connected to getting married? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it just kind of was that time for me. Uh, later, you know, the astrologers say it was my Chiron return. I don't even know exactly what that means, but you know, when you get to age 50, supposedly you start questioning things. I don't know. Um, but it might have been that I felt sort of the connection to being married might have been that um, I felt kind of like, okay, there were certain things that I thought I wanted to do in life, and that was a significant one. And that I was married happily enough to feel like, okay, maybe I, I have a foundation in my life in terms of an emotional support that's allowed me to sort of branch out. That's a guess on my part. I can't actually say, oh yeah, I know exactly what I was thinking because it's complicated. Um, and one of the interesting things was that my wife is a early to bed kind of person and I'm a late night kind of person. So she went to bed at 10 and I spent the next three hours. <laughs> on successive nights, you know, over the course of many months, trying to figure out what I wanted to know about myself. And uh, I actually went um, uh, went to bed one night, and she woke up and said, what have you been doing? And I said, I've been researching my sexuality on the internet. And she said, well, that's nice, dear, but I don't think I want to hear any details. Wow! Oh, too bad. Is that, would you have preferred to share it? Or? Yes, I would have. Oh, and yeah, she sure. was very reluctant to hear about some of this stuff. I mean, we eventually divorce not because of that one thing and we're it was an amicable divorce she lives just very close by and we get along just great and you know I go help her with her computer problems when she has an issue and um, she gives me the newspapers after she's read them because I never read them on Sunday anyway <laughs> and we have a, we have a good you know, connection oh, yeah. um, so I began that process and at, around that time because of that search, I joined, uh, or didn't join, because I didn't join anything, but I started attending meetings of a group called the Boston Area Sexuality Spirituality Network, which was started by Linda Marks over in Newton. Along with she's a friend of mine. Yes, and so that went on for, that group functioned for about eight or nine or ten years. Wow. From 2001 through about 2011, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. And during that time, I was able to learn a lot from the people who came to present, from the people who, and I joined the small group we called the core group, which is kind of like the you know, board of directors if you want, but it wasn't you know, officially that, uh, which helped find new people to come in and talk uh, or do presentations every month. So I was part of the inner group that helped run it after a short while. And I made really amazing uh, connections with people and found out a lot of things that uh, I wouldn't have found out any other way. Such as? Various groups that existed in the world that I didn't know anything about, you know, um, and things like um, Human Awareness Institute and the Sterling Institute and uh, Dark Odyssey and um, the Body Sacred and the Body Electric and all these things, <laughs> wow. okay, and I haven't even done participated in half of them, but I got this sort of sudden education into what was going on out there, which was kind of like hidden from view from most people because it was about sacred sexuality, which was a concept that most people just had never even heard of, didn't even, had no idea. They thought, you know, we have the spiritual world and then sex is the, the material world and they're, they're completely separate. And that's, that's how I think a lot of people conceived of it. And so people are talking about no we have a different take on it was, I guess, in a pretty distinct minority, but I found that I was very fascinated and interested in that minority. So then over time, I began to do things, I mean, I mean, the thing I talk about in the book is, um, I think it was like 2002, maybe 2003 at the latest, uh, some of those people had a party in the wintertime, 
and they had themes to their parties. And it was kind of like in February when it's cold and the trees are bare and it's kind of the winter blahs are set and there's no real holidays for a while. And, and they would have this party every year and they said, um, well, the theme of the party this year is glam. <laughs> glam? Glam for glamour, you know. Oh, yeah? And, and I was like, something in me clicked. And I thought that means I could wear anything I want. And I went down to the garment district right down here in Cambridge. Yes. And I went in and I said, uh, hmm. I walked up the stairs, just like describing the story here. And I looked out over the floor, and of course, if you've ever been there, it's all right hand side, everything's all the men's clothing, and on yes. the left hand side is all the women's clothing, and then in the back is more sort of costumey kind of stuff. And I gave myself permission to buy anything on either side of the aisle in that store. And I went and tried on stuff, and I had a blast. Oh, you're brave. I had so much fun. I'm so brave. And I went and um, I bought some things to take to the party. And uh, I didn't get everything I wanted there, but I got a pair of pants and some shoes and some other stuff, uh, some nice uh, polyester pants. And I went through the process of figuring out how to dress myself by talking to my wife at the time and some other people and put on an outfit. I wore silver nail polish and I had a silver lame top. And I, it was, I had so much fun. Wow. It was so good. But in my regular life, I didn't do that right away. I mean, that, was, that was party clothes, yes. you know. Um, but what I did do shortly after, there was another party the following year, and instead of borrowing my wife's purse, I went out and bought my own purse for that one. And that was an experience in and of itself, which I describe in the book, what it felt like to it suddenly have my own purse. It was like a real important thing to me internally to, to do that. Um, and then I began to carry it. And I was still dressing, you know, I went to clients that did database consulting, and I was wearing uh, khaki pants and a polo shirt and, um, you know, running shoes or whatever to work, carrying a purse. And, um, and maybe having a bracelet on or something like that. And that's kind of what I did for a while, just breaking out the, of the mold that most men find themselves in. And what was it like to break out? It was scary at first. Scary because... You well, I didn't know how people would react. Yes, exactly. And I was doing something that I hadn't really seen much of anybody else doing. Because I was still... Right, people cross-dress, but that's, this is different, I think. Well, I think the term cross-dressing is hard to define exactly because for one definition of it is being in a man's body and presenting as a woman, doing everything you can to present as a woman. Yes. And likewise for a woman, in a woman's body still, to do everything is possible to present as a man. Yes. Okay. Um, so for, so some people's uh, definition of cross-dressing is that, you know, I would have shaved my beard off, I would have put on a wig, I would have got a bra and some prosthetics or something to put in, I would do, I would try to change how I present my voice. And you didn't do any of that? I didn't do any of that. So um, you're unique? Essentially. And that's in that sense for a while, but I kept thinking as I built up courage that I was going in that direction. Yes. So by the time I got to 2006, I think it was, I went to a convention where I thought it would be, fa be safe, okay, um, where I knew people would be very accepting. What kind of convention? It's, it's called uh, the Fetish Fair Flea Market, actually. Wow! It's, it's hosted by the New England Leather Alliance, I think it's called. Okay. And, um, but it, I, the reason I went was that I knew that's one of the few places where people are willing to accept individual variations of all different kinds. My boy. So it, no matter what you're doing, as long as you're you know, not violating someone else's space or doing something without consent or whatever, and you're not, you can't be naked there or whatever, but you can dress and present yourself as anything you want. Why? And people will not bat an eye because that's what everybody else was doing. And I presented as a woman, or I did that cross-dress thing in the classic sense, in that I went and spent two weeks and hundreds of dollars and I bought a wig, and I got a new pair of glasses, and I um, went and bought a bra, and I went and bought uh, 
answers to put in it because that's all I could get at the time. And I got a skirt and a top and shoes and everything. And that was the very, very first time I went to show up as, to see what it was like to, to be in a space and say, okay, I'm a woman. And I, and I even chose a different name. I called myself Hope instead of Glenn. It was an amazing experience. So tell us what it feels like or what happened. What happened was that I had this funny sense that it took me a while to understand that something wasn't quite right about doing that. And I couldn't like, quite understand what that was. Because um, you had a very good time doing it. I had a very good time doing it. I was very nervous to do it because I, I was nervous about what people who already knew me would think, who would, yes, who would, who would right. read me. They would say, yeah. oh, that's really Glenn, but he's all dressed up like this. Yeah. And they were very welcoming. And um, I was astounded at how um, supported I was and how well regarded I was in, in my experiment and what I was doing. And I thought that I was on this path to becoming trans. In other words, I thought my trajectory seemed to be that in a few years I was going to live full time as a woman. And but right in the beginning, right while I was doing that, I began to have some questions that I didn't know how to answer. Now, were you attracted to men? No. And I don't think that's, that's, that's a completely different issue, like who you're attracted to and what your gender how you identity. Like to, how, how you like to present yourself. How you like to, how you like to be, how you like to feel who you yeah, are. Yeah. So, I mean, the terms gay and straight kind of fall apart at that point because um, they're assuming a gender binary world. Okay, yeah. you're saying, okay, I'm male, I'm attracted to males, so I'm homosexual, or I'm attracted to females, I'm heterosexual, those are the old terms we used to use, right? Or if I'm a woman, same idea, the other way around. Um, but if you say, okay, my gender identity isn't nailed down to one or the other, then how do I talk about who I'm attracted to separately from how I feel about who I am. Yes. And so I use the word affinity, meaning who I'm attracted to romantically and sexually is women. And I could be, that could be anything independent of my gender identity. In other words, I could walk down the street wearing a dress, as I do, and be attracted to both men and women, maybe. But you couldn't tell just by looking at me, because that's something that goes on inside of me. Yes. And it doesn't, it's not based on which part of the gender spectrum I'm on. It might be have an impact on what somebody else feels about me, whether they're attracted to me by saying, okay, well that guy's kind of in the middle gender-wise, but I want somebody who's only a woman, or I want somebody who's really defined only as a man, a cis man, or a cis woman, as we say. Or cis? Cis meaning same, and trans meaning across. Oh. Okay, so a cis man, if somebody's born male, and remains with their male gender identity the same as their body. And what does this stand for, cis, S-I-S? C-I-S. Which, what is it? Cis is a, is a, I guess it comes from Latin, which means same side. It's used oh. in, um, it's used in chemistry and a lot of, you can look up C-I-S as a, as a prefix. Mm -hmm. And trans means across. Yeah, I understand right, that. So that's yeah. the root of transportation, which means yeah. to move across yeah. from one place to another kind yeah. of thing. So trans would mean, essentially, I was born in a male body, and yet I've discovered that my identity is really female and I will do whatever is technologically feasible to change myself into a woman based on, you know, my economic limitations and my desires and what have you. And that's what we're going through right now in, in society is, is recognition that people have the, not only the, the medical ability to do this, but we're breaking apart the old assumptions in society to say that it's, that you kind of, you have a right to do this if you have the means. Yes, I find it very free, extraordinarily free, even though I'm a coward about this. <laughs> that would be free. Um, so that's, that's, that's basically what happened. So what I ended up discovering, I mean, I've left you hanging here a little bit, is that I figured out that I have this strong feminine side, but I also have this masculine side. And that when I was dressed and presenting, you know, as a woman with the wig and my beard shaved off and having my voice in a higher register and all that, I was actually hiding your male side. The male side. Wow. And when I went back to put the men's clothes back no, on and go yeah. home, I was hiding the female side. Well, this is a frightening show. 
Which side? Oh, <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a fight. It wasn't a struggle so oh, much as it was just a big question. Yes. Which which was after a year or so of wrestling with this kind of you know if you want to talk about a struggle of yes, any yes, kind, yes. Uh, really pondering the whole thing and saying, all right, I have had so much fun gathering a wardrobe and putting on the things and. The conversations I've had with women have just been astounding because I can go pretty much anywhere and say to somebody, I get spontaneous compliments as to what I'm wearing. I take a lot of care into what I put on and make sure yeah. things match and I like how they look and I yeah. check myself in the mirror and I end up doing what a lot of women tell me they do, which is by the time I've left the house, there are like four or five outfits lying on the bed that I tried on and said, no, I'm not wearing this today and threw it away and, and got something else. And kept looking in the mirror going, no, that's not right either. And finally gets to the point of going like, this is what I want, um, and, and taking off uh, to go out. And so people have complimented me. I've, I've almost never been harassed by anybody here in the Cambridge Arlington area, you know, in the, what some people joke, the People's Republic of Cambridge, you know, where it's like a very, by and large, a welcoming place. Yes. Um, but it's also true that, you know, there are other parts of the world where I wouldn't be able to do this. And, and be safe. It's very clear. It's 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 a lopsided progress that we're witnessing. So I ended up going out, and if I get compliments to somebody, a lot of times I compliment them back. Usually it's women. Sometimes it's men. Uh, at one point I was going down to the old uh, out of what was it called? Out of the blue. Uh, that uh, Brother Blues Gallery used to be on Prospect it. Street. Yes. And I was walking, I got off the red line because I'd taken the tea down from Arlington where I live. And I'd walked down Prospect to that place. And two different times on the sidewalk, because I was on the left side, couples coming the other way, one time the woman and the other time the man, looked at me and said, wow, I really like your outfit. Just like that. Wow. I was like, okay, I guess I'm all right. Because I was a little nervous about riding the tea and all this other stuff yes. like many years ago. Yes. Um, and I ended up opening up conversations with women because of how I'm dressed and how they understand what I'm doing and I understand what they're doing that never would have taken place if I was just walking around in a polo shirt and, and slacks. So I went. I need to sum up to just get my mind wrapped around this. Okay, sure. So it's not... I've been going kind of fast here. You know. No, you're, you're, yeah. you're, we have another half hour after this. We have okay. another three minute, four minutes to go okay. on this show. So just to sum up, so it's not that you're attracted to men and want to be no, um, that, and, 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 and I went through that. I went to Nothing I tried to explore that. that, and I discovered that just wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't right. me. It didn't stir my yeah. heart. But you still want to present yourself to yourself, if I can use that word, and to other people at times or all the time, as a person who wears a dress or is a person who's a woman? Not as a person who's a woman, a person who has sort of a gender fluid or gender queer. I mean, we're still wrestling with all this yes, language yes. right now. But I want to be able to say to people, I have this strong feminine side and I'm going to keep my male body. And so I'm, I'm a little bit of both. I am too, a big time. I'm discovering it's so freeing. But I haven't had the courage. The only time I wore a dress was when I was doing theater uh -huh. and singing a song as my mother. Oh. <laughs> so I really went to a costume shop and bought a dress. It was so freeing you like that it. I, uh -huh. I think I'm uptight enough that I just limited it to the, they said, that's the stage. I wasn't willing to say, boy, I would like to do this. Well, I think, it, I mean, it may have to do with who we are, different people, but also, if I might say about our different ages, is that all right? Yes that you were born nine years before I was. You were born back in the 40s, and I was born in 1950. Yes. So you had to marinate in, so to speak, in a society that was less tolerant for a longer period of time. I was so time. afraid I was gay when I was in my 20s. Uh-huh. Uh, and again, these thoughts were hard to really face directly. But I do remember trying to, as I was telling you before the show, trying to learn to walk straight. <laughs> <laughs> because you're afraid of your sachet, your beard, Yes, like yes, you I was afraid of that. And I remember I, had, I was 26, I had a 15 and a half year old girlfriend. Wow. I was so blessed that her parents, but 
but I think they suspected I was gay. <laughs> I think so. But they, um, I remember once her mother just brushing into me to just check things out. <laughs> and I was really asexual then. Oh, okay. I was, for reasons we won't go into here, traumatized enough. So your sexuality was repressed? I, or, or, or whatever it was, it, 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 it I had, had, would have no feeling really touching someone. Wow. And if when I held my girlfriend, we just hugged. I felt my back was going to, something was going to come out and break my back. Mm. And I would hug for a while and then say, I need to go for a run. And wow. she was 15 and a half and it was okay for her. When she was 16, she was getting too old for me. <laughs> and I went out and found, well, a, and found a real lover. Oh, well, well. But I kept her in my heart. And when I was in Israel, she came and visited. Wow. And we became lovers, which was okay, but not. But I, that's my beginning of my struggle with this. Wow, wow. Okay, well I think there's a, everybody has a story. This is my story, and it's not intended to say it has to be your story, or there's any necessary yes, parallel. that's the bravery. The thing is, I'm just putting myself out there, and I put yes. myself out there as openly as possible. Yes, but we happen to be selling these dresses if you'd like to. No, right. <laughs> we only have 20 seconds to go for this show. Oh, okay. And we'll be back for, uh, I'm sure you're riveted, and we'll be back at uh, 7.30 for another show. So in 10 seconds, we'll still be here. And what should, we, us what should we say to them in nine, eight seconds? Uh, we'll be right back after these Oh, yeah, yes, you like that. <laughs> Thank you, that was great. Okay, so welcome. This show is called God Talk. My friend Michael Mack's show, who's visiting his 103-year-old aunt. Wow. Maybe occasionally recognizes him, maybe. He's living in, in New York City. Uh huh. And so um, we have, this is a continuation of our previous show, but if you're tuned in now, you'll get the heart of it. This is Glenn. So your, your show is named? Aha, uh -huh. and this is God Talk. Yeah. Got it, okay. And this is Glenn Koenig, I'm Michael Coran, standing in for Michael Mack. And Glenn has written a book, why don't you show us? Keep the, the glint off of it. It's called A Man Wearing a Dress. Yes. And we've been talking about what inspired Glenn to wear a dress. And you're still wearing it after 10 years, yes? Yes. Well, I mean, I went, after I went to that, um, to pick up where I left off, I went to that convention, I went home. I was not, I only got dressed in things that were considered con traditionally women's clothes in what I would refer to as safe places. Yeah. I would go to certain conventions occasional certain parties. I began going to my Unitarian Universalist church on Sundays. Wow! Okay. How the hell was that? Um, every step was scared, I had to crank up my courage. Each new place I went where I was dressed unconventionally for a man was a challenge. Wait, would that be hard for me? It was not... Oh, you're so brave. It was not a you know, life or death thing. I wasn't like, you know, throwing yes. up in the bathroom before I went out of the house or whatever, but I was nervous. And each time I, I mean, I remember when I went to church one day and my friend Rachel, who was handing out the programs as the usher, and I said, you know, I'm afraid I'm a little overdressed for church. And she says, there's no such thing as being overdressed for church. Wow. And I was like, okay, good. <laughs> wow. um, but it took a while. It took years. I would say I didn't really feel like I didn't have to worry about it anymore. I didn't even have to think about it anymore until about maybe three or four years ago to just go out, put on whatever I wanted at home, go out, go to the store, go to the bank, go to the post office, even go to some clients who said, it's okay, fine, wh where would it be? I did some database work at an art gallery down in the Harrison Avenue area. And I said, does it, does it matter if I wear slacks or a, or a skirt or whatever? And she says, oh, you know, love to see you and whatever you wow. want. So, I went to work that way. Yeah. And there were other places, you know, big institutions where um, they didn't necessarily, weren't comfortable with that. They said, well, you know, if you want to carry a purse or whatever in here, that's fine, but we'd rather you not show up in a skirt. And I was like, okay, because they thought it was going to distract their other employees and people and they were Probably serving it. So that was their take. And, I, you know, I need to get paid. So I was like, okay. Um, so do you feel differently when you're dressed as a man and, and dressed as a woman? 
I think so, in a subtle way. And it's changed over time. It's not a fixed... I can't answer that as if I know the answer as a fixed thing. It's sort of, I feel different ways at different times. I mean, sometimes I feel like the feminine side of me is more expressed. Wow. And other times I feel like the masculine side is more expressed. Boy, this is scary for me. Thank you. I think you have to do... You have to take whatever steps even little tiny ones, Yes. Uh, and see how you feel. And you have to pick your, your place to, to do what you want. You have to figure out, you know, I'm going to go out to dinner with friends at their house. You know, no, I don't have to go out in public. Or, you know, what do you want to do that's going to push the envelope? And who are the people you're going to do it with? And how accepting are they going to be? And if you trust them and they know what you're doing, you might be surprised that... Uh, but trust me, gee. Mm -hmm. It's self funny. I can on, on on stage. I can do it easily. Yeah. What What about Halloween? I mean, I've done all kinds of funny stuff at Halloween. I showed up uh, as a as a woman on Halloween. With, you know, I shaved my beard off. I do yeah. all kinds of stuff at Halloween. I don't care. That's no. It's so funny. I can dress in the monk's robe, which yeah, looks like a skirt, really. Yeah, yeah, but okay, it, yeah. it looks. It has a kind of a back hood, so it looks monkish. No, and that's okay. okay. Now I don't know about for you, but for me. I, I can say from my own experience, the length of my beard turns out to be critical. It's very funny, but if my beard is more than an inch longer than this, yep. I look a lot more like some old guy who got drunk and raided his wife's closet. Oh my! No, I, <laughs> if my beard is trim, I look right, and it's and I just I have this sense of this, you know. And that might not be the truth this for you. This is a bad, bad. I'm going to confess to you. Yeah. So when I went to visit my mother down south, uh -huh. Sarasota, and had hair like this, and no beard, uh -huh. I was called man from oh, a distance. Oh, really? Not, not, not in any malicious way. People just mistook you. Yes, yeah. ma'am. And, oh. and so I, this is the, see, this is the brave person, plan versus the coward, Michael. No, I wouldn't I call grow you. my beard. You have because, beard, that's all. Because I don't want to be mistaken for a woman now. <laughs> oh dear. Yes. Sad, sad, sad. We'll see how brave I get. Well, I was at a, I should share a little bit. I was at this Human Awareness Institute, mm -hmm. which is the place to free us. It's, it's a series of workshops. Yes, yeah, a series of workshops. Yeah, weekend workshops, yeah. And the, the first workshop, um, it's clothing optional, so we can take off our clothes, no problem for me. Not at the evenings, but only at the weekend workshops. Yeah, the weekend the workshops, yeah. So, yeah. And I, we were told the man has to start touching you. Uh, yeah, you always were free to say no, but I'm such a workshop. Well, it was an invitation. Yes. Yeah. And then he has to. Right, like, but no has to. And you're, you're, you're can experiment. And I was told, I, you were invited to do this, and I'm a workshop junkie and a good boy, and I do what I'm told. <laughs> and the man touching me would touch my head and my shoulders and my chest and my belly button, and then he stops. Then I say, good workshop junkie that I am. Uh, Charlie, why did you stop? And he said, it looked like you were going to jump through the ceiling <laughs> I went lower. <laughs> and that was why the workshop was so good for me. It's really challenging. By the second workshop, I had a partner who was a black man. Mm -hmm. And he was also dutiful like me. He was, and he was way, way more uncomfortable than me. Uh -huh. And I was so enjoying that he was more uncomfortable than he was supposed to do the same thing as at this time lying down. Yeah, yeah. And we were laughing so much that the facilitator had to say, you guys are having too much fun. We've got to stop giggling. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I did graduate through that. Oh, wow. In those, in the well, I want to say something about um, your self-criticism, if I might. Yes, please. Um, I don't blame you for having those feelings. And one of the main themes in my book is about the fact that I don't think blame has any use most of the time. If you had fears, 
those are your genuine fears. Yes. And they come from how you were raised and how you are as a person. And they protected me in a little, in a way. Right. And, and it's very, we're all very complicated. It's very hard to know where our fears come from. Yes. We just experience them and then we have to figure out what to do with them. Well, yes, yes. And some people don't know what to do with their fears initially and they do things that are harmful to others based on their fears. Yes. But inside, yes. there's I, a lot of fear going on usually. Well, I've heard so many people by trying to be a man, including myself. And it might, I might be, if I gave myself a chance. Who knows what will come out if you don't try. Right, right. It's right. so free not to, to have to be a man anymore, whatever I am. So, I had a, you want me to read that passage? If you would like to, okay. sure. There's a passage, what I have in the book, as I say, it's a series of essays, and the book is a little bit uncon unconventionally structured. Um, I really don't like front matter in books, and front matter is the introduction, the preface, the foreword, the acknowledgments, all that stuff. To me, it's like, where do I start reading? Do I read this or not? You know. Mm -hmm. So I got rid of all of that stuff. Even the table of contents went to the back of the book. Yes. And so when you start reading, you just read right away. You open up the book. There's the title page, and then it says, "This is all about love." And then there's a poem about love. Oh, a great poem. I hope you read it. Oh, no, I'd like yes. to read the poem. And then, uh, well, I'll read the poem in a moment. Yes. And I'll, I'll read the thing about, um, uh, yeah, see, I have to look at the table of Ah, uh -huh. but he knows where this is. He knows where to look. <laughs> the three faces of homophobia, page 190. So, um, and I talk about, this is an essay that goes for three pages. Most of them are one page, maybe two pages, a slightly longer one. And, and um, in the second, in the third face of homophobia, I talk about um, what happens if you ask yourself the question, am I gay? And the answer you come up with is, I don't know, or I can't bear to think about it, or maybe simply, it's just not me. You, you've come to the conclusion that, that you're not. Regardless of which way I answer this question, there is still the fear that I might be perceived as gay by other people. If people think I'm gay, then I could be vulnerable to the same discrimination and attack that many gay people have suffered in the past. Not only that, what if gay people were to start coming on to me? Which it turns out is really nothing to be afraid of. You can just say, thank you very much, I'm not interested. Well, I have it's different. harder for me than that. But that's really all you have to say. No, but it's way harder. But okay. I, all right. Well, we can talk about your experience yeah. in a moment. As a result of this fear, many men subconsciously live with a whole set of rules that they abide by in order to restrict their own behavior. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. It, just as with sexism and the fear that you won't be perceived as a quote real man, this fear adds another factor that you will be won't be perceived as a real straight man. This fear is one of the main reasons that men often remain isolated from each other. The rules are, and I made a list of rules. Rule number one, don't show too much physical affection towards other men. Two, don't hug other men, but if you do, don't hug for more than a brief moment. Three, while hugging, grunt or slap the other man on the back to give it a macho feel. How you doing, Glenn yeah, Davey? Yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> or number four, perhaps just avoid hugs altogether. Go for a high five or a fist bump instead. Mm -hmm. Five, don't look each other in the eye for too long. Wow. Six, don't talk too much about your inner feelings Jeez. or fears. I must pass. <laughs> no wonder. <laughs> Seven, <laughs> refer to women as sexual objects to help solidify your affinity in the I eyes of like others. You. I haven't done any of these. So I no wonder. I've had trouble. People have, men have um, pushed themselves literally upon me. Yeah. Even though I didn't think I was... You weren't, you weren't asking no, for anything. No, I wasn't asking for anything, and, and it was hard for some of them to take no for an answer. That's very unfortunate. I'm sorry that happened to you. But I escaped to tell the tale. So let me continue for just a moment. Yes, here. please. If you break these rules too often, not only might you risk losing your status as being enough of a man, but you might be perceived as trying to get quote, too close. Yes, no wonder I broke those rules. Or signal a desire to form a relationship that's too intimate. Yes. These rules form part of what I call the straight jacket that most men walk well, around. Well, pun intended, the straight jacket. Yeah. I had it on 
It's very impressive, and it's it's only yes. beginning to be so nice. discussed. We're talking a lot about how women are oppressed, and we're getting to the point of talking about how men are oppressed too. And you have to. Oh, it's a huge oppression to men. It's and it's huge. And it's sort of a a funny question because if you look upon men as the oppressors, you might come up with the question, well, why would this happen? But I don't look at it that way. I look upon the idea of patriarchy as the thing that oppresses us, not. And, and how it's impressed on us causes us to mistreat each other because of the belief system that we've accepted. Very nice. And if we reject the belief system, it's going yes. to take time and it's a slow... Because then we don't know who we are. That's the fear. How scary. Because we had these rules that told us, that made it easy to know what we were oh, supposed to do. Oh, the old days when men were men, whoever we were. Yeah, the John Wayne movie and all that sort of thing. Okay. Whoever we were. So I put a lot of that in this book. This is a lot about gender identity and the questions that it raises, yes. as well as my own story. And it's also a third thing, which we don't have a lot of time to get involved in here, which is my look at the surrounding culture and what kind of challenges we're facing in the world right now, and why people have so much anxiety, and why a lot of the things that are going on are going on, in my opinion. I wonder why some people are like you are braver than others. My doctor became a woman. How brave of him. Mm. When he sent out a letter announcing it, I wrote him back and said, that takes balls. <laughs> oh my like, goodness. Was he like... <laughs> <laughs> did, he, did he appreciate the humor? Yes, he did. Oh, okay. He was a wonderful doctor, so, Dr. Burchell in so no, Davis Square, she... family practice, Deborah Burchell, yes. There was a story in the, in the newspaper about that. Yes, he, and we have a show that you can go to YouTube. And watch that show. Yes. So you wanted me to read the, the, the poem about yes, love. Yes, for sure. So the book yes. says this is all about love, and here's yes. the poem about love. Excuse me. What is love? That's the title of the poem. He said, I love you, in the movies, and they kissed. He said, I love you, without a sound, while lifting his mother gently from her wheelchair. She said, I love you, only by her smile, as she served soup to people who had none. He entered the room with the negotiator from the other country, as if to say, I love you and your people. She opened the box to let the spider out into its natural world. The spider never said, I love you, but this love was true. When he slowed his car, to leave a gap in traffic, he said, I love you, with a wave of his hand. All across the world, millions say, every day, in this way, I love you. One brief moment, then each one is gone, not ever counted on the evening news. Mm. Their numbers gain lists casualties, or winners some Tuesday in November. But we elect our true administration every day when we say, I love you. Oh, yeah. That's our new, our new, Len Koenig for president. No, no, I'm not running for office, believe me. If you read my book, you'll understand why I'm not running for office. Because <laughs> I think there's a big, major change going on in how all of our societal structures work. So you're, work. you're happy with your journey now, it seems. Yes, I am. I'm happy with mine, but I haven't had this bravery. It was very brave to discover, I had a teacher who, a teacher um, who was teaching me uh, Spanish, and he came on to me. And he was married, mm -hmm. and I didn't know his great gift to me besides Spanish was he helped me discover that I was by. I didn't know that. Oh. And it's now I'm different than you. It's okay to be attracted to men. Mm -hmm. I don't mind it. I like it. Okay. Um, I, I might have certain things that I don't have in my, you know, there's certain muscles. So that's men. genuine about you. Yeah. Yes. That, that I can help me get find it in me. So this is extraordinary freeing. I'm not sure I will ever. It seems it would be so hard for me to do what you do in life rather than on stage. 
you know, that. Maybe that's your opening, is to do more on stage. Well, yeah, that would be easy for me. It would be, I don't know if I want to even, but that's okay. I have to discover. But it's interesting, it gives mine. We're all freer than we know, if we dare. That's a, I mean, I brought another book with me, uh, which some of your viewers may have heard. It's called From Dictatorship to Democracy, written by Gene Sharp. Oh, I like it. Yeah. I only found out about him after I saw that he had died recently. Yes. Yeah. And I just ordered this book because I heard that people who were part of the uh, um, sort of revolution going on in, um, in the Middle East years ago yeah. used that book as inspiration. Yes. And I'll tell you what happened to me when I first saw what was going on in that square in Egypt on the news. And I literally stood up out of my chair in front of the TV and I said, and I pointed and I said, this is it. This is the revolution. And what I was indicating was that back in the late 60s, when there was uh, political demonstrations and stuff going on, there was often one or two people had a bullhorn and said, okay, everybody, now we're going to, you know, go down the street and we're going to have this, whatever. And there, were, there was a, like a, a hierarchy, a director and a bunch of people. And the difference that I saw was there we were watching people who were organizing the way the Occupy movement organized later, which was without that kind of person. The people gathered because they wanted to gather and they organized themselves, pretty much. Yeah, there were some people who had a little more sense of direction than others, perhaps, but that had shifted. And I was excited about that, because then somebody was, oh, are you good at food? Okay, why don't you, you want to do this? You, you, you do technology? Okay, why don't you take care of the technology thing? And they all created a community in a very, very, very short amount of time that functioned. They could take care of most of the needs that a community needs right on the spot. And I thought, that is where the world is going in general right now. We're losing these big old hierarchical structures. They're, they're crumbling. They're falling apart. We're finding out that the, there's corruption inside that's been hidden from view for years. And we've, we've, we're starting to look. Now, if you remember, way back in the 60s, one of the catchphrases was, down with the establishment. And there was this struggle set up. And we couldn't really get more than a certain distance in that struggle before everything shifted in the late 70s. And we kind of entered this slump after that. But didn't that happen in the Middle East too? It, it was really a failure, a horrible failure. Syria. In the late 60s? And no, then, here now. Here now is, I see positive news going on all around. I see that other things taking place in the world now, if you know where to look for the news, a lot of really positive change. Well, I love in that place. And you said it before, but as far as Syria and Egypt and Yemen. The problem is there, all those countries are all different from each other, and each one had a different reaction to this new energy that's coming along. But in general, the way I look at it is what we started to work on in the late 1960s and couldn't get finished, we're back working on it now and well, we don't really have much of a choice because these issues are coming up one after another and it's very stressful and it's very hard to deal with but we're being pushed to work on racism and gun violence and sexism and um, you know all this me too movement stuff and, and go back to the when it was when it was the boys who were suffering when the uh, priest sex abuse can scandal was going on and we've it's one crisis after another in a sense, and it's all bringing all the ills that have been going on for years and years to the surface. Yes, we should thank our president for revealing. <laughs> in a way, it was, it was always happening, but thanks to our wonderful flamboyant front president. Well, we, that's one way to look at yes, it, I guess, and it's, it's, a, it's a very tough bitter pill. corrupt and false. Some of, some of the things I mean, that... When I grew up, it was false. American history was array. We killed the savages. But I'm going to, right, exactly. That was how history was presented. But I want to say something that some people are going to probably disagree with me about. But I don't believe in vilifying the current president. I don't call him names. I don't refer to him as an idiot. I didn't. I, right. I, I know you didn't. I'm I just saying yeah. there are a lot of people when I hear that, I wince because I think I'm a universalist. I don't believe, I believe in hurtful acts but I don't believe in evil people. Now, I know that's controversial for me to say that. Yes. 
But I don't think it does me any good to turn around. I mean, I take very seriously the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, which I don't have the exact quote, but yes. where he said, you can't chase away darkness with more darkness. Yes. Well, I, Only I, the light can do that. You can't chase away hate with more hate. It doesn't work. Only love can do that. And that's a really difficult thing to do. Universalism is a tough path to take. It's very hard to say, I believe in the inherent worth of every person. At the same time, I'm free to condemn acts, what they do. So, um, to, I, we only have four minutes, three minutes, but okay. George Fox, who started the Quakers and believed that there's an inner light in everyone. Mm -hmm. And then when he was writing his autobiography, he said, however, there are certain people that I've met in England who will not see that inner light in this lifetime. And his wife, after he died, editing his journal, got rid of that. She said, that's not George Fox. <laughs> and unfortunately, the people that were listed that she dismissed from the uh, autobiography, one of them was a judge who put her in jail for the rest of her life. Wow. So uh, just That's to make a hard sad. question for you, discernment to know that some people it would be really, really hard for them I agree. See it's very, very life. difficult. So we really need to and you have, and because people are that. capable of very harmful acts, it's it's it, it's it's in, in, it's important for us to try to do our best to perceive when we're endangered by somebody. And who's, someone who is habitually doing that, it still doesn't mean that that's all that they are. It doesn't mean that's all that they are. But you have to you have to protect you yourself. Have to know that, that. Yes. Yeah. I had a friend who said, I wouldn't do this person the disservice of trusting him. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing for many people, but I think it's a very important thing because the more we blame each other and take pot shots at each other, I think the more we're retarding progress that we need to make. That seeing how to mend the differences and build the bridges and Find the common ground between people. As long as we have the discernment to see that some people like the judge. There will be the, some people who are, you know, they're just going to run off the rails really and you can't stop hard them. For it's going to be really hard. But for, by and large, I believe that by and large, most people, there's a way to build a connection. I with still them. keep hoping that our free spirited president will, heart, will be, let's say, opened even more to have compassion at least with the people who helped elect him. I, for me, the concentration is not him. He's one person out of 325 million. Yes, yeah. he's the president. He has a lot of power. A lot. But I don't think what he ends up doing in the long run is, more, is not as important as what we do. Right. What we do is way more important, and being distracted by his tweets and so on is just a distraction from our true work which is to build our bridges between each other and we're doing society that. Forward. Said, we're and we're doing that. Doing we're, that with, we're putting solar panels on the, yep. on the roofs of municipal buildings. And we are uh, figuring out how to fix the drug laws and end mass incarceration. We're doing yes. it little by little, state by state, but we're doing it. We accomplished same-sex marriage in 11 years. Nobody thought it was possible, and we didn't do it because the federal government said, okay, now you can do it. They were the last ones to yes. do it, not the first ones. Fifteen seconds. Oh, it ends at 57? Well, okay, I'm Glenn Koenig. The book here, we'll put up the, here's the website. I don't know, can you see that? That's my website, Message Rain. That's all about the book is there. And, um, that's it, we're over. Okay.